In this last lecture about multivariate quadratic systems, we're getting back to um, what I presented here as a typical case of signature systems, um, where we have a system of equations. The signature is purely um, a pre-image to something that is defined by the message or by the hash of the message, SE, well, image. And so in order to be able to compute such a pre-image, we must have a hidden structure in this X. So let's first go into what cases are easy to attack. So this is relevant in general in order to know how to attack systems, but also in order to figure out how systems could be easier to solve. Now, if you have something which is like a very triangular system, so where you have like an equation in just one variable, say x1 squared is something, then, well, it's a quadratic equation. If it's a binary field, then it's super easy to solve. Even if it's a larger field, well, you have the PQ formula, so we can fix that. Or if it's just two of those variables. Okay, well, you have a linear dependency between a quadratic dependency between those, but you can just, well, fix one and therefore compute the other. And then if it's a full triangular shape so that the next equation has just, say, one variable extra, that means you, well, put your choices down here, and then that was determined this variable, maybe up to a few possibilities. And so you can test efficiently whether your early choices were good. And then going further up this triangle, you're getting more and more variables. Let's say each time it's just one extra choice or maybe two choices. So that instead of having full exponential complexity, it's just linear times a few things. Okay, well, uh, two to the n is gonna be large as well but it's still easier if you have such a triangular shape. And so a typical attack on multivariate systems is to compute the Grubner basis of a system. So the mathematical definition is that you look at these um, equations as defining some ideal, and then the Grubner basis defines the same ideal, but has a more structured form. It won't necessarily be this whole triangular shape, but it's the nicest case, or the worst case for the security of these systems, but it is certainly um, simpler. It's trying to come up with as few possible, a few equations as possible. And so Grubner basis attacks are typical attacks on multivariate quadratic systems. And so in the other direction, of course, if you see a system which is still holding up, then Grubner basis attacks are excluded by just the size of the parameters. A similar story for XL, which stands for extended linearization and missing there. Um, so that one is basically you're doing a brute force attack, which means all well, you're putting in some value for x1, you're putting in some value for x2, except for you don't select all of those values. And you also don't just randomly pick the first five, first 50, but what you're doing is you figure out how many equations involve, say, x1. And each of those equations, each of those quadratic terms that involve x1, if you fix x1, going to turn into a linear term. So you're trying to find a not too large subset so that the whole thing becomes a linear system. Once you have a linear system, you can solve this Gaussian elimination. But of course, you potentially have to try each and every of the assignments of these parts where you're brute forcing it. So it's a fast computation once you have fixed them. But if it's two to the a large number of those computations, then it's still not a successful attack. And so again, all for XL depends on how well these variables mix and whether you can kind of find something which has more to do with others and some which has less to do with others. So Grubner basis and extended linearization, linearization are the typical approaches to attack multivariate systems. Now let's look into how we can construct such a trapdoor. So let's naively assume that we have somehow magically a system of equations for which finding pre images is easy. So like, for instance, this case of the nice triangular system. Nice for the person trying to find pre image This would be nothing you want to let go out in the world, but maybe you could have this as your secret key, as your private, private system. And then similar to how we did this in the code-based crypto, where we had a nice code, which we then was hiding with two matrices in the Maclean's construction, we're now having this nice system S hidden by two linear invertible maps. So we have um, N, which is an N 
dimensional map over Q, and we have here an M times M matrix over Q, and both of those are chosen to be invertible. And then, well, those kind of mangle the system, so they kind of hide the nice structure of S in F. First of all, yes, I mean, if, if S was triangular, but then all the variables change with some linear dependencies, that triangular structure will be gone. Now, if we know the parts that went into the construction of F, so if we know how we constructed this public key F from the secret information M, S, and N, and we also know how to solve S, then here's how we can also compute pre images of F. So somebody gives us, well, say, the signature system gives us a target Y. That's a length M vector over FQ, and we're supposed to compute the length N vector over FQ, X, so that f of x is y. Now, knowing that this is the definition of f, we can basically unravel it. So we first compute some y prime, where we just invert m on y, and so this is another length m vector, but this is now input to s. So this y prime is input to s, and we're finding some pre-image x, f, f, x prime. So this is using the efficient algorithm for s which nevertheless, I mean, there might be cases where it doesn't have pre-images, typically doesn't have pre-images, and so you need to have somewhere for randomizing. Ignoring this part here, so let's assume there is such a solution, so we're getting our x prime, then we're applying an inverse to x prime to get x, and that's the x that we output. So now the claim is that this x is actually a pre-image of y under f. Well, let's just look at it. So we're expanding f into the parts that it consists of, and then applying one after the other. Now, while well, x was an inverse of x prime, so n of x is just x prime, then s of x prime, well, that was exactly what we solved, it is y prime, and then m of y prime is y. So yes, this works. That leaves us with the problem of how to construct such a system s. Also, it leaves us with the security question of does it actually hide the structure? Now that is a complicated assumption, but for instance, you can run a group no basis attack and assume that group no basis are smart enough to find, such, uh, to find such structure if it exists, but it doesn't always find it. And so there's a bit of a battle of how large a system is, how well mixing it is, and so on. Let me go back to not the absolute beginning of multivariate systems, but the first scheme which is basically still secure with some tweaks, namely hidden field equations. So this is the first category of systems which have some trapdoor in them. And this trapdoor is that there is some fine field structure hidden behind the definition of S. So first of all, while we've been working over FQ to the N, that's FQ, the n-dimensional vector space over that, we we'll now be working in a fine field FQ to the N. So we need to have some representation of this fine field. So typically this is given with a reducible polynomial, a reducible polynomial over the polynomials in the polynomial rings over FQ. So we have this definition, there's just some G running around. And so then we have this equality here, this representation. If you have a polynomial in just one variable over FQ to the N, then we have polynomial time or quasi-polynomial time algorithms to solve those. Well, it's polynomial in the degree and has some bad the bad worst dependence on Q, but our Q is not going to be that large. Okay, so we can efficiently solve equations if it's in one variable. Many variables, the large degree is really bad. So how can we define such a polynomial in one variable and bootstrap to something over FQ with a vector? Well, we're going to do an explicit basis of fq to the n over fq. For instance, this would be uh, the powers of z. So the normal basis here is z to the 0, also known as 1, z, z squared, till z to the n minus 1. Whatever I choose, I would like to have phi to be the map that takes, well, an element in fq to the n and maps it to the coefficients with respect to this basis. So it tells me that many times the first basis vector, this many times the second basis vector, etc. Okay, when this is a map from something n-dimensional to n-dimensional, and this should be invertible. It is. 
And then we have our univariate polynomial here. So I'm using capital X as the variable of that. So this is not a, not a vector. It's not a bold face capital X. Um, and so this is a very particular um, univariate polynomial where the terms that appear, look at starting at the, well, the beta part here, we're only accepting powers of x, not x to the i, but x to the q to the i. And then the i is definitely less than n because, well, q to the n is a field equation, so anything to the q to the n would be identity map, but we're also putting some extra degree bound on that. So this is going to be appearing down here. So there is some value d which limits how large these values can get. And then there's also some alpha term of ij because there are two powers here. So it's q to the i plus q to the j. The coefficients, these alpha ij, beta i and gamma, they live in the big fine field of q to the n. And also here we can have this degree bound on the exponents. So the degree of this whole equation is no larger than capital D. And as I said before as well, solving such a system, uh, solving such a univariate a polynomial depends on the degree of it. So that's where the D comes in. All right, so then let's define this interesting map or this interesting system capital S by taking, well, it has to be FQ to the N to FQ to the N. So we're starting by going from this Representing as coefficients to the representations of fine field elements, q to the n, then having this polynomial, and then mapping back. So, this map, if you're coming from algebraic geometry, is basically a veil descent of the system of equations. If you're looking at, at phi, it's doing the veil descent, it's forgetting the structure of the fine field, it's got just going for the coefficients. And so, here we're first going from the coefficients to the large fine field. Then having this map, this polynomial, and then going back to the coefficients. And then, well, it's a system of equations in n variables, but the claim is that it's quadratic. This looks a lot larger than quadratic. This looks like it's going up the degree d. However, you should notice that when you compute a qth power, so computing the Frobenius, Frobenius automorphism, you have that a plus b to the q. It's called this freshman's dream. So it's instead of some complicated binomial formula, it's just a to the q plus b to the q. Because q is a power of the characteristics of the fine field. And so all the middle terms, all these mixed terms in the middle, would have multiples of p in them, and therefore they're zero. So the qth power map is a linear map. It's the a plus b to the q is a to the q plus b to the q. And then if you're looking at this thing here, like, okay, well, when this x gets represented, like it's mapped to like an explicit basis with this phi, but it is, well, the sum of those and the exponents are the product of those in general, so it's a product of linear maps, and the product of linear maps is quadratic. So this s is quadratic system of equations from f to q to the n to f q to the n. And the other parts, so n map, well, maps n and m, are defined the same way as before, and also the system f is defined as before. So now in order to solve this, so if now somebody asks us to find a pre-image of y, we're going one step further before we had this m inverse of y being y prime, and now we're also applying phi inverse. Now that maps it to a fine field element of fq to the n, and then um, we can compute a pre-image of this univariate polynomial, if it exists. And if so, we have this x, then we take x to the explicit basis, so applying phi, and then similar, the same as before, we're doing it as uh, n inverse. Note, by the way, that I'm using m equals n here. So because it's, these maps are just going from n to n, um, I'm going for the easier case that both are the same. I'll get to differences there in a moment. And yes, the possibility that x exists or the computation complexity depends on d, and also you might need to do several choices of this y. But the steps that get there are easy linear maps, projections, and then one expensive polynomial factorization. Well, there are efficient computations for this, of course, but this is the expensive part, 
and then some easy in your pocket. And the reason that it works, well, same as before, this X, there's a solution to S in there, and then this S has this particular structure of so solution to lowercase s matters. So historically, this comes from um, an early system to do Matsumoto and Imai from 1988. And that one has a particularly easy, which is called central map. So this, this polynomial S of X, which is just one single term, just this X to the Q to the I plus one. The nice part of this is that S is bijective. So we don't have to worry whether pre-images exist. Well, they exist, and there's exactly one of them. Well, the FQ to the N, that fine field, the multiplicative group, has order Q minus one. And if you're picking Q to the I plus one to be co-prime with this, then this is an exponentiation, which we can just invert by taking the, well, Euclidean algorithm of Q to the I plus one and Q to the N minus one. And then we know how to invert this very, very efficiently. Unfortunately, this was too nice to be true. So 1995, so seven years later, Patelin showed that you can actually find some linear or rather bilinear properties in this, which allow him to, well, not exactly reconstruct the original system, but come up with a system which he can solve efficiently to then for any y find pre-image x. The same year he produced, uh, proposed this hidden field equation was on the previous slide. And well, the downside is that S is not like bijective, but at least it stops these attacks. There are still some linearization attacks. There's still some structure in those uh, HFE systems, but it's a lot harder to break than this uh, C star scheme. So C star is mathematically pleasing, but too simple. And then HFE, well, you have to deal with the issues that it's not invertible everywhere, but at least the easiest attacks don't work. Now you don't typically see HFE systems, you see HFE with some tweaks. And so one of the tweaks is actually to remove some of the equations and that's where um, the difference between M and N comes in. So you have the central map, which is F Q to the N to F Q to the N. And then you're forgetting some of the equations. That means you're getting down to M. And that's called the minus tweak because we're removing something. And well, we just lump this into this map M. So M is no longer just FQ to the M to FQ to the M. M is now in charge of dropping the dimension to M. Now in the pre-image computation, we always needed the inverse of M. And now this function doesn't have an inverse because, well, it's not a square matrix. So this means that the image has a solution space of dimension N minus M, which is kind of welcome because this gives us extra choices. So when we pick in an inverse, we actually have multiple possibilities. We typically, well, define one matrix how we would like it, and we apply that to everything. Okay, so then um, there's another tweak called the vinegar tweak. And um, well, this is the last of Frenchmen, and Frenchmen have a thing for food. And this is also by Catalan and collaborators. Um, so they have an oil and vinegar system, and the idea behind vinegar variables is that they do not mix. When you have vinegar and oil, then you kind of get an emulsion, but they tend to separate again. And so uh, he's changing the definition of n to some n prime, where n is artificially increased by the vinegar variables. And so now the n prime is going from the larger dimension n prime to n prime, and we will change the definition of these constants in the central map to actually not be constants, but be functions. Well, okay, it's sort of constants. So these are taking V variables. So these are taking the vinegar variables and mapping them to one field element in a way that is, well, degree at most one. So it's an affine map. And that means that, well, we're getting constants VI and gamma here but those are kind of defined depending on t. And now t, well, this gold phase t, this now is a subscript to this uh, polynomial s. And so we also have to change the definition of this uppercase s, so that's the um, system of equations that you can solve efficiently 
Um, so that is now taking n plus v variables, so it's n prime, n maps to only n variables. Okay, so we have, we continue to have this phi inverse, which is going from the coefficients to the field element, and then those v vinegar variables we just pass through. And they will go in the index of s, and this part will go into the x. Sorry, it will go into the right hand side for the y, and then be solving for the x. Okay, so then to find a free image, we're picking some random t. So these vinegar variables are just extra choices. And then we compute the uppercase y the same way as before, but it depends only on this first part of the variable, so only on the n, n first parts and first components, and the other v components go into this t part. And then the rest works the same, so we're computing the, the parts of x, and then we concatenate the parts of x together with this choice of t, and then apply n prime inverse to that in order to get the pre-image. So then finally, um, HFVV minus, as you might guess from the name, is a combination of those two ideas. So it's removing some equations and it's adding these vinegar variables. So it's starting with n plus v variables and it maps to m, which is smaller than n variables as well, systems of equations. So y only has m entries, which is smaller than the n plus v n prime. Okay, so there's a lot of literature, there are lots of recent attacks on these systems, so it's an interesting area, but it's also a little bit too interesting. So we stop here.